So, I want you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We're starting a new series this morning, A Call to Joy, Philippians chapter 1. We're going to do a systematic study through the book of Philippians. should take us about 13 weeks or so. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But Philippians chapter 1. Now, some of you may recall a few years back, I think it was 2014, Pharrell Williams launched this song, Happy, as a global sensation. Now, if you've, you've heard the song, it's impossible to not tap your toes when you hear it. In fact, every time I hear it, I want to clap along like a room without a roof. But, uh, yeah, if you got that reference, then good for you. But I wonder if the people singing that song have remained happy over the years. I just wonder how many of these folks these days might actually prefer U2's song, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. See, people like that would not be alone in history. Think about King Solomon, who had an abundance of wealth, women, and he confessed ultimately that, well, everything's futile absolute futility, he said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Alexander the Great is reported to have wept in his tent saying there are no more worlds to conquer. Tom Brady, after winning his third Super Bowl championship, remarked, there's got to be more than this. Well, there is. But now, you know, since it's such a, an important concept in our studies in, in Philippians, um, let's ponder joy for a moment, shall we? See, joy goes much deeper than mere happiness. Our happiness is typically tied to external things. It's tied to our circumstances, but true joy remains regardless of, you know, what we've been experiencing in our personal lives. And as the Apostle Paul could testify, Hey, we, we can be having a really bad day, but still have joy. So where do we go to find full and lasting joy? Well, if you're interested in finding the answer to that question, well, then welcome to the book of Philippians, because this is a call to joy. Interestingly, coming from a dude who's in prison. Now, you probably know the background. The church at Philippi was started by Paul on his second missionary journey after receiving a vision to go into that region, an area known as Macedonia. In fact, this church was the first church established in Europe. And if you want more historical context, uh, you can just go back and reread uh, Acts chapter 16. Well, you, you'll see all about the people that Paul encountered there and all the converts in Philippi that led to the launch of the church there. But now, a few years later, in around A.D. 61, Paul writes from Roman imprisonment to a church that's now well established. And despite his circumstances, Paul is expressing his joyful gratitude but why? Why is Paul grateful to God with joy for the Philippian church? And, and what does he pray for them? Well, here in verses 1 through 11, we're going to find it's largely due to the Philippians' faithful fellowship in the gospel. And he prays for them that they will grow in knowledge and, and discernment and blamelessness in Christ so that they may glorify God in their lives. And that really brings us to the big idea behind today's message. Very simply that God gave us the fellowship of the gospel for our joy and for his glory. Now, if you would, read with me Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 together. Verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you and my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. 
I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart. And you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So here we've got Paul, a prisoner in Rome, yet rejoicing because of the fellowship of the gospel. In fact, there's three thoughts that he expresses here that really stand out, that describe his joyful attitude. And I want to take them one at a time. All right, so here's the first one. I have you on my mind. Verse 3, he says, I give thanks to God for every remembrance of you. So instead of thinking about himself and, you know, being in a Roman dungeon, Paul's thinking about his dear friends, the, the saints of God in far off Philippi. But why does he think of them so thankfully and so often? Well, there's a few reasons. First of all, because of their partnership. Paul's, he's got joy, not simply because of the family bond, but their ministry bond. Verse 5, he says, because of your partnership in the gospel. Verse 7, he says, you are all partners with me in grace. Well, guess what? The church today is no less a partnership. In fact, I, I want you to think of the church today this way. That 16-ounce jar of honey that sits in your pantry, that exists only because tens of thousands of bees flew about 112,000 miles in relentless pursuit of nectar gathered from 4.5 million flowers. Now, by the time each bee died, living all of about six weeks during honey-making season, it had flown about 500 miles in 20 days outside the hive. Now, as these bees are flying themselves to death, production inside the hive continues with stupendous efficiency. A bee will bring nectar to the hive, carried in her honey stomach. And that bee is greeted by a younger receiver bee who relieves her of the load. And the receiver bee deposits nectar into a cell, reducing its water content and raising its sugar level by fanning it with her wings and regurgitating it up to 200 times. And more bees will surround this cell and, and other cells and fan them with their wings about 25,000 times or so, turning the nectar into honey. Then when the honey's ripe, the wax specialists arrive to cap off the cells. And that's how every single ounce of every single bottle of honey in the world is brought into being hundreds of thousands of them through the miraculous power of teamwork, partnership. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, in the church today, when we become partners in the gospel, each functioning according to our gifts and talents and calling, as Paul described in Ephesians 4, something supernatural and even sweeter happens. As he says in verses 11 through 13 of Ephesians 4, the saints are equipped for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. So, as we embrace our partnership in the gospel, we mature in our faith. We're equipped for ministry. We learn to make a big deal out of Jesus. And people are drawn to him. And lives are transformed by his truth. And God receives glory. And there is much joy. 
See, we're to be partners in the work of the ministry, walking arm in arm. And that's a joyful thing. Paul's partnership with the church at Philippi brought him joy and thankfulness. See, he was also thankful not just for their partnership, but he was thankful for their stewardship. In fact, one of the primary reasons that Paul was writing to the church at Philippi was to acknowledge a monetary gift. It was brought to the apostle by Epaphroditus, one of the uh, members of the church at Philippi. And you can read about him in, in chapter 4. But he's thanking them, not only for their partnership in the gospel, but for their financial support. And I think this church in Philippi is a wonderful example of supporting ministries beyond the four walls of the church. And the example that it sets is, is one that I think we need to continue to follow as we financially support ministries and missions both at home and abroad. It's supporting the work of things like the, the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention, which funds the International Mission Board and the North American Mission Board, and, and us supporting the work of Southwest Arkansas Baptist Association and, and Mission Texarkana, and for the sake of one's ministry to foster families. In fact, those last two ministries were actually started in this church and grew beyond it. That's why we support things like First Choice Pregnancy Center and Katie Leatherwood's work through Greater Europe Missions and then the Honduras Baptist uh, Dental Mission and so forth. Well, for, for Paul, every memory connected to the church at Philippi, that, that was a blessing to him. I mean, even the suffering that he endured in a Philippian jail in Acts chapter 16, he rejoiced. And he rejoiced over their salvation and their growth. In fact, he tells them in verse 6 that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Folks, the Lord finishes what he starts. And Paul knew that what Christ had begun in their lives was going to be completed because Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. That's what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 12. So, here in verses 1 through 6, the first major thought that Paul expresses to the church at Philippi is, I have you on my mind. But here's the second one. I have you in my heart. He says in verse 7, Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So, Paul not only thanks the Philippian Christians for their partnership and for their stewardship, but he's also joyful about their fellowship. Think of the fellowship that Paul had with the church at Philippi in a couple of ways. Okay, first of all, it, it was definitely a matter of fondness. I mean, he thinks very fondly of the Philippian believers. And why not? I mean, they're his brothers and sisters in Christ, right? They're, they're spiritual siblings, all adopted into the same family, the family of Christ. And as such... They share a bond of fellowship. And Paul's sincere love for his friends, it was something that he couldn't conceal. Why is that? Well, because love is the evidence of salvation. I think that's why the Apostle John said in 1 John 3, 14, that we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. And Jesus said, by this will everyone know that you're my disciples if... You love one another. That's John 13, 35. You see, our love is supposed to be the spiritual oil that keeps the machinery of the Christian life and the church running smoothly. But you see, it's, it's one thing to profess your love. It's quite another to prove your love. So how is Paul's love for them evident? Well, think about this. He was suffering on their behalf. I mean, his bonds were the proof of his love. And he says, I quote, 
that he was the prisoner of Jesus Christ on behalf of you Gentiles. He wrote that in Ephesians 3.1. But you see, because of Paul's trial, Christianity was going to get a fair hearing in Rome. And decisions made in Rome were going to have an effect on the people in Philippi, which was a Roman colony. And so Paul's love wasn't something that he merely professed. It was something that he practiced thankfully, joyfully. In fact, he considered his difficult circumstances an opportunity for defending the gospel. And that was going to help his brothers and sisters in Christ everywhere, not just in Philippi. The Philippian church had shared in their gospel ministry with Paul, and their hearts were united in, in, in their love for Christ and for each other, and not even imprisonment and persecution could change Paul's caring for them and their sharing with him. The Philippian Christians unashamedly identified themselves with Paul, a prisoner, by sending their brother Epaphroditus with their financial gifts. So, Paul proved his love to them. They proved their love for him. Well, let's personalize this. What about you and I? How can we tell that we are truly bound in love to other Christians. Well, there's a number of different ways. I'm going to focus on a couple. First of all, we're concerned about each other. See, the believers at Philippi were concerned enough about Paul to send Epaphroditus to minister to him. And Paul was greatly concerned about his friends at Philippi, especially when Epaphroditus became ill and couldn't return right away. And the church at, at Philippi demonstrated love with a whole lot more than just words. You know, the Apostle John said in 1 John 3, 18, let us love not in word or speech, but in action and in truth. So they were concerned for each other. But here's something else that's a, a marker of our being bound in love. We forgive each other. See, another evidence of Christian love is a willingness to forgive. Peter said, uh, above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. That's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. So that means we don't hold grudges, okay? We don't bicker, we don't argue, we don't quarrel, we don't complain. If there's a problem, we work it out. And if there is offense, we choose to forgive because that's what Christians do. So Paul was joyfully thankful for their partnership and their stewardship and their fellowship. But you see, that fellowship, it existed not simply as a matter of fondness. It also existed as a matter of function. Yes, he wrote, I have you in my heart. I mean, even in prison, Paul was rejoicing. But I think part of the reason for his joy was his single-minded focus. His mission was, was solely for Christ and for the gospel. In fact, on at least five occasions, Paul referred to himself as a servant of Christ. Now, it's interesting that in the Greek, the word that he used, doulos, it actually means one who is solely committed to another, such as the relationship between a master and his subject. In fact, in some contexts, that word is even translated as slave. So for Paul, Jesus was Lord. He was in charge. He was the boss. He was the A1, the big cheese, the top dog, the big kahuna. He was the master, and Paul belonged to him. Paul was all about Jesus Christ. Serving Christ was his purpose and his function. In fact, Christ is mentioned just in chapter 1 of Philippians alone 18 times. And the gospel is mentioned six times. He says in verse 21, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In essence, what he's saying is, you know what? It doesn't really make a difference what happens to me just as long as Christ gets the glory and the gospel gets shared. And Paul actually 
rejoiced in spite of his troubling circumstances, maybe even because of his circumstances, since they actually strengthened both the furtherance of the gospel and the fellowship of the gospel. Now, that, that word fellowship, it, it basically means this. It means to, to have in common. Okay, so Beach Street, what do we think of when we hear the word fellowship? Uh, yeah, you got that. You know, Sunday school class, Christmas party, you know, maybe a youth swim party, um, chili cook-off, ice cream social, potluck. Yeah, it is amazing how many of our associations with fellowship have to do with food. But you know, true Christian fellowship, it's really something more, something much deeper than us just, you know, sharing coffee and donuts at Sunday school or throwing some fatty meat on the grill before the big game or even, you know, sharing a round of golf together. You know, it's more than just us gathering together in the family activity center for fun and food and, well, for giving Misha Oliver her annual award for her epic baking skills. But uh, in fact, what we think of as fellowship is really more just friendship. See, fellowship is something more than that. Now, if fellowship means to have in common, well, then it's hard for us to have fellowship with someone unless we have something in common with them. So for their Christian fellowship to be genuine, what did Paul and the Philippians share in common? And, and likewise, what should we as Christians today share in common? Well, there was their love for God, their faith in Christ for salvation, their love for each other, and their commitment to the gospel. That's the fellowship of the gospel. So yeah, their fellowship was a matter of fondness, but it was also one of function. That function, the gospel mission. That was their partnership. So in verses 1 through 6, we saw that the first major thought Paul expresses to the church at Philippi is, I have you on my mind. Then here in verses 7 and 8, he told them, I have you in my heart. You see, the fact that he's got them on his mind and in his heart, well, that's evidenced by a very natural result, which is the third thought expressed. I have you in my prayers. Paul says in verse 9, and I pray this. Now, Paul found joy in his memories of the friends at Philippi and his love for them, but... He also found great joy in bringing them before God's throne of grace in prayer. Now, here's an interesting tidbit. Did you know that in the Old Testament, the, the high priest, the only one who could approach God on the people's behalf, he wore this, this special garment, uh, like a, a breastplate over his heart called an ephod. Now, on this ephod were 12 stones with the names of the 12 tribes engraved on them, a jewel for each tribe. So symbolically speaking, the high priest was carrying the people over his heart in love. Well, guess what? So did Paul. He carried them in his heart, and quite possibly the deepest fellowship and joy that we can experience in the Christian life is before God's throne of grace, praying for one another. Paul took time to pray for his people. Now, what does he pray? Well, it's a prayer for maturity, for their continued spiritual progress. And in the verses that follow, he prays several different things for them. In fact, as I was reading his request, it, and this is just how, how weird my mind works sometimes. They almost appeared to me like these, these Russian nesting dolls. Okay, you know the ones I'm talking about where you open one up, there's another doll inside. You open that up, there's another doll inside it, and another, and another, and another. As you read this prayer, it's like each thought grows out of the previous one. But here's some things that Paul prays and things that we should pray for each other. First of all, that your love will grow. 
See, our love for God and our love for each other, that needs to flow unrestricted. It needs to grow unrestrained. Paul says in verse 9 that your love will keep on growing. Now we know that love is one of those fruits of the Spirit that he wrote about in Galatians chapter 5. We know that love is what enables all of the spiritual virtues, the spiritual gifts to be exercised properly. He wrote about that in 1 Corinthians 13. But without love, no Christian, no church really, is spiritually complete. I think that's why Paul wrote in Colossians 3.14 to Put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Okay, so how specifically should that love grow? Paul gives us two ways. First of all, in knowledge. You see, for our love to be genuine, it needs to be intelligent. Now, what, what do I mean by that? You see, love is not a phenomenon that's just restricted to the emotional sphere. It's not just for feelers. It's also for doers and thinkers. It's head, heart, and hands. But see, Paul is saying that our love should be enhanced. It should be illuminated by an intellect that recognizes truths from the Bible, the, the Word of God. And that knowledge is a very practical thing that's meant to be applied to the Christian life. Because when it is, that spiritual knowledge enables believers to love what God commands, but also to love who God commands. Okay, now there's a second way Paul says our love should grow. In every kind of discernment. When Paul says that he wants them to grow in every kind of discernment, I think this is stressing moral perception. In, in other words, clearly recognizing the difference between right and wrong, truth and falsehood. So, for I love to be genuine, Paul says it also needs to be morally discerning. Well, then what is the result of love that's intelligent and discerning? Well, that's actually the next aspect of Paul's prayer. That's the so that portion. I mean, basically Paul's saying, I'm praying this so that may be the result. What result? That you may be approving. Approving of what specifically? Verse 10 says that you may approve the things that are superior. See, there's a reason that Paul asked God for their enlightenment and discernment because it helps them to choose the things that are more excellent, the things that are most excellent. I mean, think about it this way. If you had a choice between a little Nissan Versa that's like $30,000 and only gets 25 miles to the gallon and a brand new BMW that's only $15,000 but gets 40 miles to the gallon, which one are you going to choose? Well, it's a no-brainer. And of course, this is a completely absurd example because you're never going to find a BMW for $15,000. <laughs> but you get the point. Paul's not talking about simply choosing the good, but choosing the best. Because in reality, sometimes the good can actually be the enemy of the best. It can cause us to settle for things that are less than God's absolute best for us and for the church. And so, Paul prays that your love will grow in knowledge and discernment, that you'll be approving of what is best, and that you may be blameless. Verse 10, that you may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. Now, Paul had already stated that he wanted them to approve the things that are superior. Why is that? Well, because differentiating between those things that are right, wrong, good, bad, true, false, you know, discerning that is what helps us on the day of Christ. Now, that's the second time in this passage that he mentions the day of Christ. Remember, in verse 6, he said, He who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, the day of Christ is a day in which all believers must stand before the Lord and give an account of their works, their, their deeds. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul refers to this as the judgment seat of Christ. Now, because we've placed our faith in Jesus, you know, our, our eternal destination is secure. So this, this judgment doesn't determine our destination. It just judges our works and determines whether they're worthy of reward and in heaven. And works that aren't, they get burned away. And so that thought of the day of Christ, you know, it can be both joyous and sobering, but because it is, it ought to have a purifying effect on our lives. So pr Paul prays that your love will grow in knowledge and discernment so that you may be approving of what is superior, so that you may be blameless on the day of Christ. And then there's the final, so that. So that you may be fruitful. Verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Now, what does Paul mean? I think he's talking about transformed lives. I think his desire is that when the Philippian believers do stand before Christ, that their lives will have been filled with the right kind of fruit. You know, the, the spiritual fruit that comes from a life that has lived for Jesus Christ. Fruit that can only be produced by His Holy Spirit. And so, Paul's prayer is that they might live full lives. It's a prayer for Christian maturity. Now, what is the desired end result of the love and the knowledge and the discernment and the approval and the blamelessness and the, and the fruitfulness? Well, of course, he wants them and us to be faithful in their daily walk, in their Christian service. But look at the end of verse 11. To the glory and praise of God. It all comes back to that. This is why Paul prays that prayer. This is our ultimate purpose. This is why we exist. We exist for God's glory. And what's one of the main byproducts of our praise and worship of Him? Our joy. Which really brings us full circle to the big idea that God gave us the fellowship of the gospel for our joy and for His glory. Paul tells them, I have you on my mind. I have you in my heart. I have you in my prayers. All right, Beach Street, so what do we draw from all of this? You know, how do we take Paul's sentiments here in Philippians chapter 1 and put them to work in our own lives and in the life of our church? Well, based on what he said here in the first 11 verses, I think there's three very obvious starting points, three action steps. And the first one, ponder one another. In other words, let's say of each other, I have you on my mind. Or as the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good work. So let's give some thought to one another, to to what others need, to how we can bless one another, to how we can encourage one another, how we can motivate one another to good works. So we ponder one another. Here's the second one. We prize one another. I have you in my heart, Paul said. Let's not simply love one another as a state of the heart, but let's love one another with our lives. Let's make that conscious choice to value one another as fellow members of the body of Christ. Let's prove our love through our actions toward one another. And then finally, and most obvious, pray for one another. Make a conscious effort to lift one another up in prayer to the Lord. Not just for our healing, you know, when one of us gets sick, which is very important, but praying for each other's spiritual growth and, and well-being. Pray that love will grow in knowledge and discernment, that we may be pure and blameless on the day of Christ, that we may be fruitful. So the big idea here is pretty clear. But now let me ask you the big question. 
Are you part of the family of God? Are you a partaker in the fellowship of the gospel? Because if you're not, you can be. And if you want to have a personal relationship with God, it's pretty simple. It's repent, believe, and receive. We acknowledge that we're all sinners, that we fall short, and we repent. That word means we change our minds about the way we've been living. And then you choose to believe. You believe in the death and resurrection of Christ for you. And then you receive, by faith, God's gift of forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. I mean, it's basically you as an act of faith telling God, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me. I need your forgiveness and salvation. I believe in what Jesus did on the cross, and I believe that he rose again to prove his love. And so I am choosing to make him my Savior and Lord, and I'm asking you, God. I'm calling upon you. God, please save me. If you've never made that choice before, I pray that you won't leave here today without making it.